Hello and welcome to my makeshift studio. In today's video we will be discussing how to pick out parts for and assemble a custom computer. Um, this is the completed build we will be talking about today as well as all of the parts spread out. I'm going to cut in here to warn you. The parts overview is a little lengthy. If you're not interested in hearing about these parts and instead you just want to see how to assemble them, skip ahead to about six minutes. The first component we chose with our motherboard, this is an AORUS B450M board from Gigabyte. Uh, it was chosen because it is a gaming motherboard, meaning it is a uh, fairly high performance, uh, offers a lot of ports. Uh, it was primarily picked because of its compatibility with the parts I wanted. It has an M.2 slot for our storage. Um, it is a micro ATX motherboard, so a smaller form factor than a full-size ATX, um, but not quite as expensive as the smaller form factor Mini ITX. Moving right along, we have our processor here. This is an AMD Ryzen 5. Um, it is an AM4 socket, which is exactly the socket this motherboard has. It's important that those match. This processor was chosen because it is a pretty solid gaming processor as well as a very powerful processor for general workstation use like video or photo editing or word processing, that sort of work. We're cooling it today with a large liquid cooler. This is a 240 millimeter radiator unit from ID Cooling. Uh, it of course offers RGB uh, as well as our RAM. In fact, you may have noticed just about everything in there has RGB, everything that could at least. Um, the RAM is from Silicon Power. It is DDR4, 3200 MHz. Unfortunately, this motherboard does not offer RAM overclocking. Uh, it is not supported. The maximum speed it supports is 3200 MHz. Um, so if I had done a little more research, I could have gotten some 3600 MHz RAM and then taken advantage of the Infinity Fabric uh, with the uh, Ryzen processor. Uh, but that's always something we can upgrade later because we will learn how to today. For storage, we have a Samsung 970 Evo Plus. That is a 500 gigabyte NVMe M.2 SSD. Uh, may want to upgrade that later. Maybe, uh, maybe add an additional one terabyte hard drive or SSD uh, for mass storage. But uh, the benefit here is that these are very, very fast storage, oops, storage devices. So they work very well for keeping your operating system as well as other uh, frequently used intensive programs as well. We also have a 650 watt power supply from Corsair. Uh, we picked this model because it is RGB of course. Um, it is an 80 plus bronze certified unit which means um, it doesn't have the best efficiency but it is pretty efficient and we got it a little cheaper than we would have gotten an 80 plus gold certified power supply for. It also is fully modular, which means the cables can be plugged in only when they're needed, so you won't have extras hanging around, which makes for some nice cable management, uh, which both looks good and improves airflow, thus you will improving your thermals as well. The graphics card used in this build is an AMD RX 580. It is important that this build has a graphics card because this processor does not have integrated graphics. You may not need a discrete GPU for your build, just depends on your use case. Uh, if you would like to learn a little bit about picking out parts for your needs, see the PowerPoint in the description of this video uh, for, a, for my thoughts on picking parts out. For additional cooling, we are using 140 millimeter fans from Thermal Tape uh, with an exhaust set up up top and intake in the front, um, as well as the fans included with the cooler, of course. There's probably more cooling than strictly necessary in this build, but it looks nice, and if you have more fans, you can run them at a lower RPM, which makes for a quieter build. In addition to our main components, we also have our peripherals, like a keyboard, uh, mouse, and monitor, which aren't pictured. We also have a USB drive with a Windows installation media on it. I'm not going to go into creating your installation media, as there are multiple ways you can install Windows, and of course many other operating systems you could choose from. Uh, we used Windows in this build, so I will briefly detail that. We're also going to be using some higher performance thermal paste. This is TG7 from Thermaltake, and it has a higher um, 
conductivity than a lot of other thermal pastes. And it's not strictly necessary as your cooler as well as your CPU will likely come with thermal paste, uh, but some high performance paste may see some temperature drops, which is always good. I've also got a screw uh, and accessory set that this comes with a few washers, motherboard screws, standoffs, and some other hardware that you may need. Not strictly necessary, but nice to have in case you lose something. As well as a electronics screwdriver and bit set. Uh, not strictly necessary as you will probably be able to assemble your build with just a Phillips head screwdriver, uh, but it doesn't hurt to have some. Uh, you'll probably want some zip ties for cable management and that's pretty much it. Now this isn't intended to be a be all end all or best practices guide to building your PC. Rather it will just outline my process as well as what I think are some helpful tips and tricks to both shopping for parts and assembling those parts into a build. So let's jump right in. Here we are in PC Part Picker System Builder, which is linked below. I highly recommend using it when planning your build as it will tell you of any compatibility issues between your parts, as well as give you an estimated wattage, which will help you when shopping for a power supply. Here you can see my list of parts. It's very easy to add or change components in your list. For example, if we want to add another 16GB RAM kit, we click Add Additional Memory. We can filter products by brand, capacity, speed, timing, etc. Or we can simply search for the product, which I'll do because I know what we need. Here is the kit we already have, so we'll add another. You can see the builder is warning me of some potential issues, so let's take a look at that. The first warning is letting us know that some motherboards with this chipset require a BIOS update to be compatible with our CPU. We aren't worried about this, as our particular motherboard has been updated by the manufacturer. It also tells us that by utilizing the M.2 slot, we will lose functionality of two SATA ports. We aren't worried about this either, as we won't be using any SATA ports in our build. If you plan to add optical drives or additional storage drives, this may be of concern to you. Here we are looking at the CPU socket on our motherboard. We begin by opening the bracket that latches the processor in place. Locate the pin 1 identifier on both the processor and the CPU socket. Align them as you gently set the processor in place. Do not press down on the processor as you may damage the pins. No force should be necessary to install the processor into the socket. Once seated, lower the latching arm back down and secure it in place. That's it. Next we're going to install our SSD. Make note of the notch in the pins, and align it with the M.2 port. It is important that we install the drive at approximately a 30 degree angle for it to properly seat. Ensure that the standoff is installed in the correct hole for your SSD. Once inserted into the slot, Press down on the drive until it meets the standoff and screw it down. Next comes the heat spreader. It is equipped with a thermal pad which helps dissipate heat from the SSD. It has a tongue on one end which fits into a bracket on the slot. The other end gets screwed down into its own standoff on the motherboard. Next we're going to prepare the case to work in. Remove the thumb screws securing your side panel or panels and slide them off. If you aren't sure how to remove the panels for your case, check your owner's manual. I like to thread the screws back into their holes so I don't lose them during the build. We're going to remove both side panels, as well as the dust filter and the front panel. Next, lie the case on its side. 
and we're ready to install our motherboard. It's important to ensure your motherboard standoffs are correctly installed before attempting to secure the motherboard. If the standoffs are in the wrong holes for your motherboard, you risk scratching and damaging the pins or delicate copper traces in the circuitry. If you don't use standoffs at all, you will likely short circuit the board directly to the case. It's also a good idea to protect against electrostatic discharge or ESD. ESD can damage components, rendering them useless. An anti-static bracelet which grounds you to the case is the best way to prevent ESD. I don't own one, and so I'm taking other precautions, like frequently making contact with exposed metal on the computer case to discharge my any static. Installing the motherboard is simply a matter of aligning the board's mounting holes with the standoffs and then screwing it down. I like to tighten the screws working from the outside in to ensure the force is applied evenly. Do not forget to install the I.O. shield before installing the motherboard. This is a classic PC building blunder. In fact, I forgot to get a shot of myself snapping the I.O. shield in. Rest assured, it is in place. Next, we're going to install our RAM sticks. It's typically easier to do this before you install the motherboard, but I lost the footage showing that, so I did this take. First, open the latches at the ends of the memory slots. Next, simply align the notch in the memory module with the block on the slot and lower it into place. Clasp each end in place by pressing down on the module while lifting on the latch. Do this for both sides of both modules. Make sure you choose the correct slots for your RAM configuration. The dual channel setup we are using in this build requires using slots 1 and 3. If you aren't sure which slots are correct, check your owner's manual. While we're here, don't forget to plug in your CPU fan. The astute among you have no doubt noticed this is not the cooler shown in the beginning of the video. The stock cooler turned out to be pretty loud, so I actually replaced it and featured it in, in this video. Now we're going to install our case fans as well as the radiator for our liquid cooler. This motherboard only has two case fan headers, so the first thing I installed was a fan splitter. As you are positioning the fans, think about where the fan cables will be running, as well as which direction your fans will be blowing in. Generally, fans blow towards the hub. There will often be a little arrow on the case of the fan, denoting which way the air flows. Secure the fans in place with the provided screws, threading them in from the outside of the case. There's a bit of debate about the best case fan setup. Generally, it's best to have a good mix of intake and exhaust. Experiment with your fans and find what gives you good thermal results. Here you can see the radiator and some fans installed in the front of the case. If you're using a liquid cooler, it is important that the CPU block is not the highest point in the loop. If the water pump and block are above the radiator, air will accumulate there, causing overheating and shortening pump life. Before we install our modular power supply, we will choose the cables we need for this build. Here I have the 20 plus 4 ATX connector, 8 pin CPU power connector, and 8 pin PCIe power connector for our GPU. I also have the 4 pin Molex power connector for our water pump in our CPU cooler, as this motherboard does not have a dedicated water pump header. Before plugging in anything, we are going to pre-route the cables to get an idea of how we're going to organize them in a tidy manner inside the case. This process can take a while to get right, but you'll thank yourself later for it. The CPU power connector will go up top. The 20 plus 4 main power connector will be somewhere coming kind of in the middle. The front panel and GPU connectors will likely need to be run uh, near the bottom of the motherboard. Keep playing around with your cable management until you find a tidy organization that works for you. In the back of the case here, you can see the 3.5 inch drive bay, as well as two 2.5 inch SSD bays. We won't be using any of them today, but that's where you would install your SSD. We're just going to install our power supply by sliding it in through the gap. Line it up with the holes for your screws, and then simply screw it down into place. Now we'll begin plugging in connectors. The power supply connectors, like most of your PC connectors, will be keyed, meaning they can only be inserted one way. Simply push the connector into the receptacle until you feel it click into place. It probably would have been easier to do this before I installed the power supply in the case, but there's plenty of room down here and it wasn't too difficult.
Back inside the case now, I've already installed the front panel connectors visible in the top left corner, the cables for power switch, reset switch, case speaker, power light, and HDD LED are the trickiest to install. Take your time, consult your motherboard documentation, and double check your connector orientation. Plug in the 8 pin CPU power connector, front USB connector, USB 3.0 connector, front audio, and the 20 plus 4 power connector. These connectors are also keyed, so check their orientation before attempting to connect them. The main power connector may take significant force to plug in. Support the motherboard from underneath while installing it so as to not bend or break the board. Now that most of our other components are installed, we're going to mount the cooler's water block on the CPU. First, install whatever bracket or other hardware your cooler needs. Next, remove the protective plastic from the block. Forgetting to do this will surely result in overheating your CPU. We'll start by cleaning the processor. This is especially important if you have old thermal paste on the CPU from another cooler. I previously installed the stock cooler on the CPU, so I'm using alcohol and cotton swab to repair it for fresh thermal paste. I like to apply thermal paste in an X pattern, but many will recommend simply squeezing a pea-sized drop in the center of the CPU. If you'd like, use a spreader to create a thin layer of the paste across the CPU. There are many different coolers out there, and many of them require aftermarket brackets. Just be sure to read the manual before installing your cooler. Follow the directions closely. This water block is installed with four thumb screws. I'm going to tighten each screw slowly, working in a crisscross pattern to secure it evenly to the CPU. We're now going to prepare to install the graphics card. First, we need to open the corresponding expansion slots. This card actually requires two expansion slots, which is pretty common with larger cards these days. With this case, all you have to do is just pop the slot covers out and then bend them until they snap off. Align the card to ensure you've opened the correct slots. Before installing the card, prepare the PCIe X16 slot by lowering the latch. Then, gently lower the GPU into place. Press down until you feel it snap into its connector. Once installed, reach behind the card and ensure the latch is secured. Then, install the screws to secure the card to the case. The final step is to simply plug the power connector in. Now that everything is installed, we need to deal with this mess of cables hanging out of the case. This is probably the most tedious part of PC building. I like to test fit all of the cable's positions before securing anything with the zip ties. Take your time at this step and don't be afraid to undo your work and try different configurations. You should end up with nice neat cable runs and a case that is free of dangling cables that might block fan blades, obstruct airflow, and look untidy. Here we are in the UEFI BIOS. 
you can see a list of drives that the computer sees and can boot from. We can see a list of peripherals. We have a BIOS version and the, of course the chipset this board has visible. If we click memory settings we can see the speed of the RAM as well as the capacity we have installed. We get the ability to set custom fan curves so that we can have our PC run very quietly if we would like. But for the time being, I'm just going to exit and commence with installing Windows. With the USB installation media installed, Windows boots directly into Windows PE. Proceeding through the Windows 10 installer is pretty easy. Just follow the on-screen instructions and configure Windows to your needs. Once Windows is installed, the first thing you want to do is ensure your display settings are optimized. Next, I'm going to ensure that Windows sees both of our 8GB sticks of memory and also make sure that we have the proper graphics driver for our GPU. I should probably mention here that it is very important you plug your monitor into your GPU and not your motherboard to actually take advantage of your graphics card. Since we don't have the proper driver, I'm going to navigate to the manufacturer's website and download their install wizard. If you're going to install additional expansion cards like wireless network cards or other expansion cards, you'll likely need to download a driver for those as well. And that's pretty much it. You're ready to start using your system. Thank you so much for watching. A uh, special thanks goes out to Professor Sawyer for assigning this project and giving me an excuse to build a new computer. Hopefully this video serves as a straightforward guide to choosing computer parts and assembling them into your dream computer. Hope you enjoyed.